It is so good to be back home. Yeah. Yeah. Good to be at camp meeting. Yeah. Amen. I am, uh, seems like every time I go to camp, I, you know, you go sometimes, you've heard a lot of preaching over all the years that you live for God, and really there's, there's nothing new under the sun, right? There's only so many subjects that can be preached. And yet I come away amazed with, with the insight, revelation that God gives to his ministers. Yeah. And uh, some of the messages that I heard, I, they were not just messages to listen to. Right. They were messages that will change your life. Amen. And, uh, amen. There was that, that first message that talked about calluses. Yeah. Right. That everybody needs to listen to. Right. Yeah. Everybody needs to listen to. And I'm just sorry that we just can't get it on DVD yet, but uh, uh, we will circulate the CDs. Everybody needs to hear that message on Calvary. Right. It is just phenomenal. It'll touch your heart and change you. Amen. So good to have our visitors here. Good to have my, my niece. Yeah. Yeah. She's yeah. still over here, by the way. It's Crystal going to stand so we can all see who you are. <laughs> And uh, I'm going to try and bring her over as often as I can on the weekends. Amen. Get her sister over here too as well. Yeah. Amen. Amen. It's good to have Greg with us again. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Just stand, Greg. Let everybody see who you are. There he is. Amen. Of course, it's good to see all of you. You all look good. Everybody turn to your neighbor and say you look good. Amen. 
And it's a little bit more than just saying, yes, Lord, I believe that you did all this for me. Somewhere along the line, you've got to say, God, I want to give you my life. Amen. Amen. We just talk about Jesus and it change people's life. And it seems almost childish at times to talk about Jesus for us as adults, doesn't it? Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Saying that in Sunday school. Thought of it as the children's song. You know something that's just as applicable to my life now at 59 years of age as it was when I was 5 and 6 and 7 and 8. Jesus loves me so very much. I just I just really feel like I'd love, like to love him back. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. I'm going to talk to you for a little while. Okay. Talk to you for a little while. Something about being the pastor that just lets you get away with a whole lot of things. I have the microphone. I have a captive audience, as long as you don't fall asleep. Everybody say, I'm going to stay awake. I'm going to stay awake. See somebody beside you falling asleep again. Hey, Amen. Can I tell you how much that I appreciate all of you? Except for Brian. <laughs> I just, it's just such a joy. And for all of you that made it to camp meeting, I want you to know it's just such a joy to see all of you there. Yeah. And uh, my life was, this last week was extremely different. I uh, had lots of work to do and was running back and forth to board meetings out to Hope and, and then back in for early morning to go back to work again and then back up to Hope for evening service. And, and I spent more time on the road this last week, I think, than I have in a long time. And I had jobs that uh, did not go well and that have to be revised and changed, in which uh, my schedule has to change. I got a call from Andy just before service started today saying that his load is too heavy and he can't make it home and that uh, we're going to have to try and do something to get him home. And uh, <laughs> so there's just uh, And Sharon is a... <laughs> Please figure out a way to get my husband home. Well, I gave him a hard time about having a day off yesterday and going to West Edmonton Mall, so uh, now they've got some extra days, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Amen. But it's so good to belong to the church. It's so good to have brothers and sisters and have people that you love and care for. And I, I want you to know that as a pastor that I just, I feel that for all of you. It is in my heart that I want to see all of you succeed in living for God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to see you live for God. I want to see God do great things with your life. Amen. And uh, sometimes difficult to watch people. And you may wonder why Terry and Kelly aren't here today. They're preaching in Courtney today. And uh, so there, Brother Terry's preaching in Victoria, and Brother Terry's taking his place, and so they're not here. But I miss people when they're gone. Right. Amen. I miss being here for Tuesday night, sitting around and yakking and drinking coffee and eating soup and, and Carl's uh, buns and bread, and uh, being able to visit with all of you in the Bible study. I love Bible study. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Don't you just love the Word of God? Yeah. Enjoyed that Bible study this morning with yeah. Brother Rob. I, I, we're gonna, you're going to hear a lot of different people, really weird and strange people. No, just different yeah. people. <laughs> Teaching on Sunday mornings and, uh, and probably on Tuesdays while I'm gone. But you know what? All of them, if they will speak about what God is speaking to them about. Yeah. That's right. Casey, I think, has next Sunday morning yeah. service. Yeah. Everybody gets to yeah. yeah. I know that all of you are going to be here on your feet, amening her. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And, and uh, well, at least her husband will be. More than her husband. Probably her, well, no, maybe her, no. Her mom and dad would be away teaching somewhere else. Amen. Let's stand together, shall we? Amen. I don't want to keep you for very long. Finally, look like we've got a little bit of summer that has arrived. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 14, 17.
17 and 18, familiar passage of scripture. If you've been in this church any length of time, I just kind of like this passage of scripture. So Romans chapter 14, 17 and 18, and uh, going to talk to you a little bit about joy. Joy's good, don't you think? Amen. How many know that the uh, the American Constitution allows them to uh, the pursuit of happiness? Right. Have you noticed that about you read the American Constitution? Every man is granted these things, you know, and, and in one of them is the pursuit of happiness. And uh, good thing maybe to pursue happiness, but I think I, uh, looking at the way that they pursue happiness as compared to what God wants to give us, I think I'd rather have the joy of the Lord in my life. Amen. <laughs> Happiness is kind of a fleeting thing. Yeah, it can very much depend upon who you're around, whether you like them or not. It can depend upon whether your job satisfies you or not. Whether or not you have enough money to buy things or not. Happiness can be so temporal, it's fleeting at the best. And uh, that movie, The Pursuit of Happiness, that shows that individual that went eventually into stockbroking and and various things, and then sold his company for millions of dollars. I, I, I was disturbed by it. Yeah. Because everything about it indicated that the only thing that was going to give him the happiness that he was pursuing was the fact that he had enough money right. to be able to support himself and his children. And I admit that that's a good thing. You know, it's nice to have enough to keep yourselves fed. Right. I like eating. You may have noticed that. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody is with me back there. I heard somebody finally. Was that you, Leo? Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I don't like that, but I want, I want my, my life to be much more dependent upon things of God than it is the things that are around us. Wouldn't you? Yeah. Amen. So I want God's joy. Romans chapter 14, 17, and 18. We'll read this, then we'll pray, and I'll let you be seated. I have therefore whereof I may glory. That's not That's it. That's the wrong scripture. <laughs> it's a good one. Yeah. Let's go to uh, the chapter before that. For that was chapter 15, not 14. It says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Whew. Good scripture, isn't it? Yeah. Verse 18. For he that in these things serve Christ is acceptable to whom? God. Uh-oh. I'm in trouble a whole lot of the time. I want you to know. Is acceptable to God and approved of men. How many of you want a good witness in this world? Yeah. Want a good witness? We're talking about witnessing. How many of you are going to take these cards and go invite somebody to church this week? Yeah. 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 We'll, we'll do that again. How many have got those church cards? Yeah. Yeah. Got, who doesn't have any? Put your hands way up. Brother Ted, make sure all of these people have one of those cards. Oh, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up if you haven't got one. There we go. The effect is give these people more than one. Okay, hands way up. Brother Ted's just making his way from the back. Hands up if you do not have any of these cards. All right, there we go. I, I want so very much for, for my own life to be a witness. And if that is to be so, then I must serve God according to the scripture. That's what the Bible says, right? I will be approved of men. People want to approve of the way that they, I live my life. They want to look at me and say that I've got something more than what other people do. I've got to live my life this way. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Thank you, Lord, so very much for your word. I thank you, Jesus, that it can speak to us and change us. Lord, for as it was mentioned in this morning's Bible study, it is a scalpel that can divide aside the things that do not belong in our lives and remove them while allowing those things that need to remain to remain there. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray that your, Lord, your word may have its effect in our lives today. Lord, that you will anoint me as I speak, anoint your people's hearts and ears and minds, that they will be able to receive your word in Jesus' name. 
We're going to send in Jesus. Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. I mentioned that uh, just a little bit in prelude, the differences between uh, this world's happiness and, and the type of joy that God wants to give us in our lives. Uh, you will notice that the scripture kind of indicates that in verse 17, where it says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Now, it's not literally referring to meat and drink, although it is using that as an example of those things that should not or that we should not be centered in on in our lives that we think are going to bring us about the happiness or, or the things in our lives that we truly desire. It is not about worldly things. The kingdom of God is, is not about what's going on around us. It's not those things that you think are so important. It's not having a clean house, although it's good to have a clean house. It's not even doing well at the jobs that God has given you, although it's good to do good at those jobs that God has given you. It's not about that next paycheck, although it's going to be good to get that next paycheck. Everybody said amen. amen. Hallelujah. It's not about, that's not what the kingdom of God is about. That's the kingdom of this world. Yes. Now, the kingdom of this world is, is, that, is so different than the kingdom of God in so many different ways uh, that we're not even going to be able to touch on them all. But I do want to touch on this one part that is so relevant to our walk with God and so relevant to our acceptance by God, according to the scripture. And so relevant to our being, if you want to look at it, approved by this world. But I would rather look at it a little bit differently than just the word approved. But the word approved can mean not just that they look at you and say, yeah, they're living a good life. But yeah, those people are living a life that I would like to live. Those people have something that I do not have. And I want to be able to have something like that in my life that's going to make a difference to me. And uh, it's a rather a sad thing when you begin to look around you, and I've talked to family members and, and friends and those that I come in contact with. And one of the fellows that I work with, uh, have contact with while I'm working on the mainland, is a fellow that's been around since, uh, he's worked for Nickel Brothers since even before I started working. He was a friend of my brother's, his name is George Duick, and, and he's been there like forever. And so he, he opened up the paper this last week, and and he opens it up, and here is an article that says, that right at the top of the article, Did Man Create God? And he thinks this is some great revelation. His father used to be a preacher, by the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he thinks this is some great revelation. He's not living for God. But you can tell by the things that are going on in his life and the things that affect him, you can tell that, that there's no real joy in his life. He's still looking to justify the way that he's living by an argument that was is so old that, man, we could go back in history a long way as that argument has always been there. Did men create God or did God create man? Right. Well, I want you to know something. We're not halfway intelligent enough to create God. That's right. But I find that I'm so complicated in the way that I am made up, and worse than that, I find that women are so much more complicated than even I am. Preach it. <laughs> that there is absolutely no way that there is not an intelligent design behind this creation. And everybody said amen. amen. Uh, so I got to talking with him just a little bit, and, and of course he, he does it with intent because he knows I'm a preacher and he doesn't believe in God anymore. And so we got to talking about it. But to find out that their arguments are so weak, they're going back so much to those same old arguments that from centuries ago, people are still questioning the same old thing. I want you to know something. Why is it in your heart to seek something eternal? Yeah. It is because God has put the eternal in our hearts and minds that we might seek after him who dwells in eternity. Amen. Amen. We have no access to eternity without him. That's right. And so God has put the thought of eternity in our hearts, the thought of something that is beyond this human existence inside of our minds and hearts so that we might look to the one that has created it all. We might say, God, I want to be yours because I want to see something a little bit more than just going to work every day and making a living every day and feeding my family every day. And I know this, that every job is a job or later it's going to get old and it's going to get boring and it's going to get all of those things but eternity is going to be forever and there is going to be joy forever in eternity Amen, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah Hallelujah Amen Amen. And so I find that, that if 
I am going to be acceptable to God, have a witness and a testimony in this world, that I need to live for God according to the dictate of what this scripture says, and that says I need to live my, God, my life in righteousness. Is there anything worse than somebody who claims to be a child of God and lives unrighteously? Because everybody out there knows, because I'll guarantee you, if you do something wrong, if you swear and curse in front of somebody who's not living for God, their first thought is a Christian should not live like that and shouldn't say things like that. Right. Amen. If you are perverse in your thoughts and in your language, the first thought that's going to occur to them if you do not have righteousness in your life is, as a child of God, they should not be thinking like that and they should not be talking like that. Everybody said amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. This is good. Amen. Really? It is. This is the word of God. It's not my word. Amen. And so, I would need to live my life righteously, but I'm not going to preach on that today. We'll save that for another day, okay? Everybody say we'll save that for another day. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So the next part of it, I need to have a peace in my life. Yeah. I need to live with peace. Yeah. All of you that worry, say this, together with me, I need to live in peace. Yeah. There's a lot of worry in the midst, aren't there? I need to live in peace if I am to be acceptable to God. Amen. 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 That means we have to be able to hone and develop the ability to lay things down. Somehow, there are some things you're not going to do without practice. There are some things become better every time you pick up the drumsticks. Yeah. Not the one you eat. That one seems to come natural. There are some things that come better every time you sit down in front of a keyboard and practice singing, right, Crystal? Because I heard her in the middle of the night. The other night. She's practicing. She's going to sing. Yeah, that's awesome. I love this. And uh, some things just don't get any better just by sitting there and hoping that you're going to get talented. So you got to practice that. Can I tell you, none of us are built in with the ability to lay things down given to God. We are born into this world shaped in sin. We are, there is iniquity that abounds in our lives. We do not have the ability in our own to be able to do this. It does not come easy. You want to know what I do? I go and lay it down, and then as soon as I get out of this church, I'm going to worry. What am I going to do with Andy? Yeah. <laughs> oh, let's just leave him there. No. <laughs> <laughs> just leave him there. <laughs> we want to go and want to leave it there, but we, we have this habit. We just pick it back up again. Somehow, we're going to be acceptable to God and approved by this world. Those in this world, we've got to develop and hone that ability to be able to lay things down and give them to God and walk away and leave them. Just leave them with God. Can I just make something, just correct something for all of you? This does not mean that God is going to do everything for you that you can do for yourself. You better do what you can for yourself in developing the qualities in you that God wants to place there. But the things that you can do, cannot do anything about, the things that you can't solve on your own, and those things that you just can't seem to find a solution for, I want you to know there is a God that cares enough about each and every one of us that when we lay them down and give them to Him as the Word says, lay all your cares upon Him, for He careth for you. All your worries need to be laid down for Him to take care of and help you with. That is the only way you're going to find that peace. Amen. And be acceptable to God and approved of men. I told you I was in trouble with all of this, didn't I? Okay, everybody stand for a moment. Nice and warm and comfortable in here. Do you want anybody to fall asleep? Everybody stretch. Hey, man. Stretch. Get, get the blood flowing. Hey, man. Everybody good? Okay, you can be seated. So we're going to talk about joy today. I believe that, that there is one thing that, that not only impresses those that are around us with the fact that there is a God that's in our lives that has made a difference,
But it also impresses us with the fact that we do have something real in our life. And that is that through all the different situations and circumstances of our, of our life, that we are able to have a joy that supersedes our circumstances. So we want to talk about joy. I like people that are joyful. I like people that are joyful. Amen. 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 I've got some people around me that, that aren't very joyful. But I like being around people that are joyful. I would rather be around a person that's joyful than a person that's serious any time of the week or day. I just like being around them. You know why? They lift me up. They make me feel better about living for God and being who I am and being around them and going to work. Heaven help us if it was all just miserable people where we work. If it is, I'm sorry for you. I like being around joyful people. Amen. And you know what? I, I'm much more impressed with them having God in their lives than I am with somebody who's just serious, even if they're serious about the Word of God all the time. I don't want that to be a, you know, maybe we better shut up the camera for a little bit. Become a doctrine or anything. But I would rather be around somebody who joyfully serves God if they don't know not one neat thing about the kingdom of God and about God's word than to have somebody who's so serious about all the things about God's word that that's all they are is just serious all the time. Show me some joy in your life. And I'll tell you, I'll show you somebody who's got enough of the Holy Ghost yeah. that their circumstances aren't going to affect them the way that it does for those that are so serious about life all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Please be around somebody ignorant in the scriptures. I'm, I'm being facetious and I'm going way to the far end of the scale just to kind of make a point here. But please be around somebody who's ignorant of the scriptures but is so joyful about their salvation that that's all they can think about and they want to worship and praise God. And I'll tell you, I'll want to be around them every time. I'll like being around people talking about the things of God, maybe even arguing a little bit, disputing about this, that, and the other thing, and all the things that are coming. But put me around somebody joyful ahead of that any time. Amen. Uh, the joy of the Lord, the Bible says, is our strength. Without joy, we lack strength in the Holy Ghost. Right. Without joy, you're going to be weak. Without joy, you're going to fall into temptation. Without joy, you're probably going to, I don't know, maybe so depress the people around you that they don't want to live for God, too. We've got to have joy in our lives. Now, uh, the Bible tells us and does talk about joy. And I'm just going to touch on five different things. Five different things? Yes, five different things that will bring joy into our lives or that should, according to the Word of God, bring joy into our lives. First of all, in Ezra chapter 6 and verse 22, it says this. It says, and they kept the feast of the unleavened bread, and, and there's a bit of a pause that goes down, uh, seven days with joy, for the Lord had made them joyful. So here they are, the, the temple where God's presence came and dwelt, where the Ark of the Covenant was, had been destroyed. Ezra and Nehemiah went back to Jerusalem, began to build up the, the city, and they built the temple again. And then in Ezra, they dedic rededicated the temple. And when they did this, this is where this passage of scripture comes in, at the dedication of the temple. Now, I want you to know something. When every time, I know this gets old, and I know that when I preach about us coming and dedicating ourselves to God, you know what you do when you come to an altar and you say, God, here I am, take and use me? You're dedicating this temple again to God's use. You're saying, God, here's my body. This temple, for our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Amen. When you come to an altar and you say, God, here I am, I want to give myself to you, you're rededicating that temple. It's the same thing that happened in Ezra. They're rededicating that temple that Solomon built before that time, and they rebuilt it and rededicated it. And the Bible says that they were joyful in it. Can I tell you, every time that we come, every time that you feel God move on you, you say, God, there's some things, I just want to rededicate myself to you today. Yeah. Every time you quote that scripture at an altar and you're on your knees and you're saying, Lord, here I am. Use me, Lord, in whatever manner that you want. I offer up this body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto you. Use it the way that you want. I'm telling you, do it with joy. Yeah. Lord, here I am. Not reluctantly, not with... Uh, you're looking at it and saying, oh, yeah, I'm going to give myself to God. Look, I'm not going to be able to do this, and I can't do this, and I won't be able to do this. Uh-uh. Just say, God, here I am with joy. I give myself fully and completely to you. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There is joy in the dedication of God's house, and there is joy in the dedication.
dedication of this temple, this house, to God. Psalms uh, 126, 2 and 3 says this, Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue was singing, uh, the Lord hath, because the Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. If you go back and find out what this psalm is about at the beginning of it, it is the reason that they're happy and the reason that they're joyful is because that they have been delivered from captivity. Some of us are held captive. We're held captive in, in things that we have held on to. Not necessarily even sinful things sometimes, but sometimes things just have gotten a hold of our lives and we just can't seem to let it go. Right. And it consumes our thoughts, consumes our hearts, and seems to get a hold of us to the degree where, where that's the first thing that comes to us at the morning when we get up. It's the last thing we think about at night because we're in captivity. But all oh, when the delivering power of the Holy Ghost touches us yeah. and takes that away where we can say with assurity, God has delivered me from the captivity that I was in, that I want out there is a joyfulness that comes with being free. Amen. Amen. There's a joyfulness that comes with finally being delivered from something that has had a hold of us that should make us just, oh, I want to thank you, Jesus, for the things that you've delivered me from. And sometimes when we come to God, those that are new and coming to God, they look around and they see people who look righteous, they look good, and they think, oh, those people didn't have it like I did. Can I tell you, all of us at one time or another, and maybe still do, have things in our lives that God delivers us from and has delivered us from. Amen. 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 So, when we come and we begin to worship at the beginning of service, or we begin to worship at the end of service during altar call, you can just lift up your hands and begin to praise God for what God has delivered you from. Amen. Amen. There is joy in God's deliverance from captivity. Amen. Isaiah 61 and 10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord my soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with garments of salvation. With joy we shall draw waters from the wells of salvation. The Bible says, listen, when God brings salvation into your life, there should be some, all of heaven is rejoicing. Amen. There is not one person that can come to God in repentance that all of heaven does not rejoice over that repentance. Can you imagine what heaven must be doing when we baptize somebody in Jesus' name? Can you imagine? Because now instead of just forgiveness, those sins are going to be washed away out of that person's life. And I mean heaven is going to be ecstatic with everyone that is baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sin. Can you imagine what heaven would be doing when somebody receives the Holy Ghost? I mean, if heaven rejoices over one person that comes to repentance, think about this. What must heaven be doing? I went to camp meeting this last week for some of the services. Didn't make all of them. Last, I think it was the last night of camp meeting. They were praying for this young fellow, and, and so I went and helped them pray for just a little while. It wasn't too long before, and I don't even know how old he is, maybe 12 or 13 years old. It wasn't too long before this person was, this young fellow was speaking in tongues that the Holy Ghost began to fill him. Yeah. And I thought to myself, and you know that's so amazing to me. Yeah. And it's just so amazing. But I can just imagine what is going on in heaven yeah. when that boy started speaking in tongues that the Holy Ghost filled him. Amen. If heaven is that way, Brother, Brother Lenke said this on the last night of service, we better start now. Why should we wait till we get there to start practicing? Right. Because one day we're going to be up there in heaven together with all of those that are rejoicing. I'm going to tell you, you're going to stand up like a sore thumb if you're sitting there doing nothing. Right. You are just going to be stuck. And you're going to think, what's going on? On one side, you've got angels crying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. On the other side, they're echoing, holy, holy. Man, you're not going to fit in very well. We may as well get that joy going in our lives now. Every time that somebody comes to repentance, 
every time that we have the opportunity to repent, every time we see somebody baptized in Jesus' name, every time God fills somebody with the Holy Ghost, man, something inside of us should be just, whoa, glory, hallelujah. Okay, amen, amen, amen. Jeremiah 15 and 16, and Jeremiah was referred to as the weeping prophet, so we've really got to look for it times, times when he was joyful, right? Yeah, he was just like us sometimes, you know, man, you got to start looking for it. Here's Jeremiah 15, 16, says this, thy words were found and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Look at Jeremiah. His life was, was prophesying to a backslidden country. He didn't want to serve God. He wept over them continuously that God would call him to prophesy and that they wouldn't listen. And here he is and he said, But when I opened up your word, when I ingested your word, when it became a part of me, Boy, there was something that went along with it that was joyful, and it brought joy into my life. My heart was joyful because of your word. I want us to have a love for God's word like this man did. That in the midst of, of what he had to do, in the midst of a nation that didn't want to serve God and being their preacher, that every time he opened up the word, there was joy there. Yeah. Every time that God spoke to him, there was joy there. Every time that you opened the word of God, oh, fall in love with the word of God. Amen. 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 Fall in love with it again. Don't wait till Sunday or Tuesday till it's preached or taught. Put it beside the chair where you like sitting and open that word up and begin to read it. You got some spare time? Oh, I gotta find something. No, open up the Word of God, begin to read it, and, and take joy in what God is speaking to you about. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Last one. Let's stand together as the musicians come. First Peter chapter one verse eight. Because it wouldn't be any good if we just stuck to the Old Testament. We need to find something in the New Testament, too, that refers to the fact that we need to have joy besides Romans that I read to you already. So we go to Peter's letters. Now, you need to understand something, a little something about Peter. Peter was kind of impulsive. Would say things, just, you know, Jesus would ask him a question. Boy, if he had the right answer or the wrong answer, it didn't matter. Peter spoke up. He was the one that, that was just there. And when Jesus asked, who do men say that I am? It was Peter that stood up and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus gave him the keys to the kingdom. So that we know that at the beginning of the book of Acts, the beginning of the church, and the things that Peter preached, we know that those are keys that open up the door of the kingdom. Repentance. Click. Baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Click. One more law. You shall receive them, the infilling of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and all those that are far off, even in name. Click. The Lord our God shall call. And the door opens up to the king. Peter was the head of the church at the very beginning. He was ordained to it by Jesus himself. Sometime a little bit later, we find that Peter has been either removed from that position, but we find out that James, the half-brother of Jesus, is now the head of that young church. Peter has been placed a little bit into the background, although he's still considered an elder of the church. Eventually, the Romans at that particular time uh, began to persecute the church. Originally, it was with tolerance that they accepted the early church and its belief and its teachings. But that did change, and persecution came to the church, and they took James, and they killed James by taking off his head. 
And uh, then they came and they also eventually took Paul as well. But Peter was taken and imprisoned in Rome because he was at one time the head of that early church. This man who had been so prominent at the beginning is now one whom Jesus had prophesied that was going to be taken to a place that he did not want to go. And so he knew that his death was not going to be one that he would like. And history or legend or whatever tells us that Peter was eventually going to be crucified just like Jesus. But did not consider himself to be worthy to be done just the same way. And so when the time came for them to take him to be crucified, look at what this old man says. Because he's not young anymore. He said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my master. I want you to take that cross piece that was at the top. I want you to put it at the bottom and hang it upside down. And so it is that they took this old man and they would hang him upside down. But look what he said. Look what he's got in his heart. In 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse 8, and I'm reading in the Amplified, he says, Without having seen him, you still love him. Though you do not even now see him, you believe in him and exult and thrill with inexpressible and glorious triumphant heavenly joy. There he is. When every other reason to be joyful, you can't seem to find. Be joyful in the fact that your faith tells you that despite everything that's going on in your life right now, joyful, triumphant, because my faith says that the Word of God is true. And if I've been obedient to the Word of God, and my relationship with Him is continuing to be something that is first in my heart and mind, no matter what this world may do to me, I'm going to be with Him. And the one that began a good work in me, He's going to be faithful to complete it. So the last reason for joy in all of our lives Lord, despite everything that's going on and all those that would tell me that I'm stupid for believing in you, Lord, I know that you're real. I know that you saved me. I know that you gave your life for me. I know, Lord, that you washed my sins away when I was baptized in your name. I know, Jesus, that your spirit dwells within me. And, Lord, that you have given me through your spirit power and authority to use the name of Jesus when I pray to use the name of Jesus when there are things in my life that need to be revealed I can use that name for I am yours and when all else fails around us you say Lord I still believe in you and that triumphant heavenly overwhelming inexplainable and inexpressible joy that comes with knowing that you are his yeah. and that he is yours yeah. will so consume you and overwhelm you that all the rest of your problems will fade into insignificance. Joyful. Yeah. Hallelujah. Of course, it is.